بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنا معلينا يا عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah Almighty and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah and my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is once again a great opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this comes from him to be here tonight in his house. And we're all the guests of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I want you to understand that concept and remember that concept and feel proud of it that you are currently the guest of Allah. Maybe it sounds too little, but when you think deeply of it, you realize that it's something great. That I am the guest of Allah tonight. Someone might get and sit down with someone who is special, or someone who is famous, or someone who is powerful. And if they are their guests, they'll be talking about them visiting that person or being their guest for the rest of their lives. But can you consider and remember and remind yourself that you are tonight the guest of Allah Azza wa Jal. So when you go home tonight, you think and say, I was just the guest of Allah, the Lord of the universe. I have been honored from the many creation of Allah to be the guest of Allah. To be from those who Allah had invited to enter, enter his house and to be in his house. How great of a thing is that, Ikhwani? For every single one of us now, just consider that you are the guest of Allah. And you are being given the greatest hospitality from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah. Which by Allah, if you gain all the wealth of this world together, wallahi ikhwani, the hospitality of the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah is a lot greater than all this. And tonight, as you all aware, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we will continue with the biography and the seerah of the greatest creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That seerah that we left you with before the month of Ramadan. That we ask Allah azza wa jal to accept our deeds and actions during the month of Ramadan. We will continue tonight and the next Monday is coming up with the seerah. The biography of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And let us all keep in mind my brothers and sisters in Islam. That this seerah is not made to entertain our souls. To listen and say, wow, that's very nice. But this seerah, my brothers and sisters, it's made for us to reflect and ponder upon. For us to look back and say, this is the example. This is the way of life I want to live. This is the role model I want to follow. This is the example I want to be like. This is the whole aim of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the beautiful thing about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, that no man in history, no man in history, and this is something that you could go and look into, no man in history, that their life and their character has been collected in so authentication and precise the way the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life and character and biography has been put together. Which man, which man in history, which women in history, which of the greatest of people in history that you could see their life story, their life story, their biography or their character has been collected in so precise, in so authenticated, to put together the way the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know everything about the Prophet ﷺ from before he was born till after his death. In so precise, so authentic, so just, just, so firm, so balanced. No man in history. 
Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants this to stay to the day of judgment. Because there's no longer prophet, there's no longer prophet or messenger after the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah azza wa jal not only had accepted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be a messenger, but sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger to the whole world. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger to all mankind and jinn to the day of judgment which makes him unique and different to the rest of the prophets and messengers before him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where the 114,000 prophet and messenger before the prophet alayhi salatu was salam was either sent to a nation, to a town, to a certain type of people, to a tribe but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sent to the whole world وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Though we indeed sent you a mercy to the whole world. وَأَرْسَلْنَاكَ لِلنَّاسِ كَافَ To the whole mankind. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And before Ramadan, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we spoke about the history before the birth of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. And from the history we realized how Allah Almighty prepared Allah Azza wa Jal prepared the people and prepared the land and prepared the environment for the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had came. And it reached a time before the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam where it was 500 years and there was no prophet and messenger. And that was the longest period ever that no prophet and messenger has, ever been, has never been sent. When the Prophet alayhi salatu came, he was sent, yes, he was sent, he was born in Mecca, he was sent among the Arab, but he wasn't only sent to the Arab, he was sent to everyone. And we speak inshallah from the birth of the Prophet alayhi salatu We recall that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal, how he prepared Mecca and the people of Mecca for the message of the Prophet alayhi salatu and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he comes from a noble family. As the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said in many ahadith, that Allah azza wa jal had made the people two parts and he made me from the best of those parts. And all prophets and messengers come from noble families regardless that their parents were Muslims or non-Muslims. When we say noble, that means they had respect. So no prophet or messenger will ever come out of a marriage that's out of a wedlock. It doesn't, that, that's impossible to all prophets and messengers. Prophets and messengers will come from respectful families, regardless their parents were Muslims or non-Muslims, including Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is agreed upon that his parents were non-Muslims. And his grandfather was a non-Muslim. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, was the leader, and one of the most respected leaders ever came to Mecca. And he had a lot of respect, he had a lot of uh, respect from among his people, people listened to him. And Abdul Muttalib had 10 children, and we spoke about the story how uh, he promised that if Allah Azza wa Jal grants him uh, 10 children, he'll slaughter one of them, and then it came the Lord and Abdullah. And then the story goes on when he went to a, a fortune teller and so forth, and we spoke about that in the last lesson. Now, Abdul, uh, Abdullah got married in a young age, and they say he was in the early 20s. He got married to Amina. Amina was a far relative of the Prophet uh, of Abdullah, which a far relative uh, Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib. Now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's birth begins from there. Abdullah gets married to Amina, and then they get mar they get married, and then they move in together, and then Allah subhanahu wa taala will bless them with a child. That child is known to be as Muhammad. Now, before we go into that, let us understand a few things. That Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passed away a few months before the birth of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam came into this world with no father. A few months before the birth of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, his father Abdullah went on some journey to Syria and on the way back, he passed away near a place in Medina. And that was a few months before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Some scholars say two months, some scholars say three months. But it is uh, agreed that it was before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. So here the Prophet ﷺ will come into this world from a mother, but had already lost his father. 
which what we refer to as a yatim. Yatim means an orphan. And the definition of a yatim in Islam is someone whose parents had passed away and they're under the afwan, someone whose father had passed away before the age of puberty. So it's the father. So if the mother is still alive, that person who lost their father is still considered to be a yatim and orphan as long as they are before the age of puberty. But after the age of puberty, you don't call someone a yatim. We do not call anyone a yatim after the age of puberty. This is the concept and the definition of a yatim in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born into this world as a yatim. This is Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam. And obviously, Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam was born as a yatim for no coincidence there was a preparation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a reason. There is a reason from behind why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born a yatim. It's not like something that was coincidence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam for a great mission that no man had ever ever been prepared in the past or in the future. So obviously the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam needs to receive special training. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will make him take on this great task and responsibility. And one of the training procedures that Allah Azza wa Jal had trained the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on is that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam was born as an orphan. And what's the meaning from behind that? My brothers and sisters in Islam, people in love are different. And the emotions of people, the emotions of people differ from one to another depends on the experience that people went through so my emotions is different to your emotions in certain matters in life it depends on my experience with that matter so for example when some close family member passes away in my from my family i understand a lot more than someone else who had not experienced that i know the emotions of it because i experienced it and a lot of other things in life. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had been, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had been trained to experience the toughest and the most roughest emotions. And one of the hardest things that someone can live in life is to grow up with no father. But not only this, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the age of six he even grew up with no mother. And we'll see that inshaAllah. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born as an orphan. And by the age of six, he even lost his mother. So by the time he opened his eyes into this world, and that's the age where the children become aware. By the age of six, seven, we call it sinni tamiz, which is the age of discrimination. The child starts to be aware. He knows, okay, this is right, this is wrong, fire burns, knife cuts. That's the age that the children start to become aware. By the time that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam opened his eyes to this world and he became aware, he also became aware that he lost both of his parents, mother and father. Which is something that as much as I explain it to you and how emotionally it does feel, you would never understand it as much as someone who experienced that. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he experienced the toughest emotional experience which makes him understand everyone. And that's why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam understood everyone. What's so unique about Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? One of the unique characters of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, not only was a prophet and not only because he was a messenger, not only used to receive a revelation, of course that was the most unique part, but there was other unique matters in the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is the social relation. It's the social relationship of the Prophet ﷺ with others and how people used to relate to him and how he used to relate to others. Obviously, this is a skill, a talent. Not anyone can have that. You, you meet people in life that for the first time you speak to them, you love them. What makes you get attracted to them is their social talents and the social skills that attracts you to them. And you meet people 50 times, you can't, even, you can't even stand sitting down with them for one minute because they don't have that social talent or skill to deal with you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the attraction for everyone. Everyone used to get attracted to him. The young, the old, the poor, the rich, the strong, the weak, the slave, the free man, the woman, the men. 
used to all get attracted to the Prophet Sallallahu Why? Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood how to deal with them. And that understanding, one of those things that played a big role in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to understand how to deal with everyone is in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He went through a rough experience. And that rough experience, he grew up with no mother and father. He's got that feeling. He knows how it is for people when they lose their family members, when they lose their parents, when they lose their mother, when they lose their father, when they lose their kids. He's got that. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through that. So he understands. And when he understands, he knows how to relate to them. He knows how to... He knows that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to relate to him. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows how to deal with him. So Allah Azza wa Jal prepared the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a yatim from that young age. This is one of the things that the scholars speak about. Not only that, but one of the reasons that the scholars also speak about why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to grow up as an orphan, is there are also other aspects and reasons that the scholars speak about. One of them is so the accusation or the points of the fingers of accusation do not point at the Prophet ﷺ that what Muhammad had came with, he learned it from his parents. He learned it from his father or he learned it from his grandfather. Well, Muhammad ﷺ did not see his father and he did not even, his grandfather did not last long to be around him when he became old and mature. So one of the reasons that people use, this is something that you are calling for what your parents used to call for, for what your fathers used to call for, for what your grandparents used to call for. Well, Muhammad wasallam was born and his father was dead and his grandfather passed away when the Prophet wasallam was eight years old. So how can you accuse the Prophet wasallam of coming with such thing or how the Prophet wasallam came with such message that he learned it from his father or he learned it from his grandfather? And many other things that the scholars speak about. So we go back that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. He was born in Mecca. He was born from a father called Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. And he was born from a mother called Amina, Amina bin Wahab. This is the, wife, the mother of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The wife of Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam was born in Mecca. Early morning on Monday, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on the 12th, as some scholars say, or the 9th of Rabi' al Awal from the month of calendar, the, year, the Islamic calendar, the year of the elephant. The year of the elephant, which the big event of the elephant, Alam Tara Kayfa Fa'ala Rabbuka Ashab al Feel, had taken place, and we've spoken about that in the early, in the early series in the, before Ramadan. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born at 571. 571 from the actual calendar that we have you know, after, uh, after uh, the birth of Christ. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was born, Straight away, Amina, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ, sent the good news. Usually they sent it to the husband, but there's no husband. So Amina, the, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ, sent the good news to her father-in-law, Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib had that respect. And when Abdul Muttalib saw the face of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no other choice except to be attached to him. And who could imagine that this child that's been born on that day, in that moment is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And anyone that will see this child, there is no other choice except to be attached to this child. And especially when that child is your grandson. And especially when your own son had passed away. So Abdul Muttalib was so attached to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and named him with a name that was rarely used at that time by the name of Muhammad. By the name of Muhammad. And the word Muhammad derives from the word Hamida. Hamida in Arabic means thankful or a grateful servant. Muhammad means a servant that's constantly being grateful and thankful to Allah. And that's truly the character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the scholars say that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the third to be ever be named Muhammad at that time. So there was already... <coughs> I found there was already two people named Muhammad at that time and some say he was the first ever to be named but the name Muhammad was no doubt was a rarely used name among the Arab in Mecca. When Abdul Muttalib saw that beautiful child and little the Abdul Muttalib knows that this child is going to be the leader of mankind he took him and went to the Kaaba and the Kaaba was a sacred place to them 
regardless of what their faith used to be or what their creed and their beliefs used to be. But this is one of the things they used to have. The Kaaba was a sacred place. And if you want the, the blessings of God, and regardless what God they used to believe at that time, is to get to the Kaaba. So they, Abd al-Muttalib, when he grabbed the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his newborn grandson, he took him and he went to the Kaaba and he entered the Kaaba thanking Allah for the great blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed upon him and his family. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was first breastfed by his own mother and then by a slave woman by the name of Thuwayba who used to belong to Abu Lahab. Now Abu Lahab is the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And obviously there used to be a good relationship between the Prophet alayhi wa sallam and Abu Lahab all the way just before the prophecy. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two daughters. Those two daughters got married to the two sons of Abu Lahab. Until Islam came where Abu Lahab became so anti-Muhammad and he became a great enemy of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, that relationship had broken. At that time, my brothers and sisters, the Arab used to have customs. And their customs at that time is different to our customs these days. One of the customs they had, especially the people of Mecca, Mecca used to be considered to be a city. And usually the city, the diseases in the city are a lot more than the diseases outside the city. And the children that grew up in the city grew up in a luxury, fancy, comfortable life. What the Arab used to do, and one of these, these, these are the customs and the mentality, they used to always look at the children to be the rough ones, to be the tough ones. And that's why they, change, they give them strong, tough names. Like for example, Antar. Why they used to call him Antar? Just because when they used to break into war, just by the enemy hearing the name, Allah, this guy's name is Antar, or his name is Asad, a lion, or his name is this, they get scared for just from the name. So it's all emotional. And the Arab used to, they used to teach the children on roughness. But that was not convenient for them to do that in the city. So what did they used to do? They used to send the children out to the nomads or the Bedouins. Out in the desert, for the children to go out and live with the Bedouins, live out there in the desert, they become rough, they become tough, they learn the language, their body becomes, their immune system becomes strong against any disease, and then they come back after a few years, they are fit and strong enough, more, than, and the more rougher than any child that grows up and is raised in, in the city. And what happens, and of course this becomes like a business, Okay, obviously the people of the city have a lot more money than the people who live outside the city. So the people outside the city used to come every season and see if there's any children that to be taken away with them so they could make money out of it. And as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is living among those people with that custom, his grandfather and his mother wanted to send him out. And you hear the amazing story where the people from Bani Sa'd came into Mecca. The people of Bani Sa'd, they used to live out in the deserts and they used to have their own lands and they used to be more of farmers and Bedouins who used to be isolated away from the city. And they used to be known to be those who used to come to Mecca and take the children of the people of Mecca and raise them with them for years and make money out of it. Now the people of Sa'd, the, the children of Sa'd, or the tribe of Bani Sa'd, came to Mecca seeking business they're looking at the children who's got a child a new child that would like to send them with us we could raise them in uh, in the desert or you could raise them on the farm make them strong and give them back to you now the people the tribe and he said there was few women few breastfeeding women who are willing to take children but every time a woman will come across the prophet muhammad sallam, the young baby and they ask about his father what do they say he's dead so straight away if the father is dead who's going to pay us don't worry about this child. So all children were taken except the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one would want to take the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, assuming that what are we going to get out of this child if his father is dead? There's no money. There's not, no money to make. So there's no point to take this child. Subhanallah wa Allah azza wa jai, when Allah plans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans in a wise way and a great manner. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned that one of those, among those ladies that came from Bani Sa'd, her name was Halima al Sadiya. Halima bint Abi Dhu'ayb, Abdullah bin Harith al Sadiya. Halima, all her mates, all her friends, managed to get a child, except her. And she was from those 
who the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also proposed to her, but she refused to take him because she said, what am I going to get out of this child? His father's dead, that means he's no money. What's the point? I came all the way here for the sake of making money. But later on when she realized that all the children are taken and everyone else from her friends and from her town mates are going back with a child except her, that became an embarrassing for her. She came all the way from her, you know, from her town, coming all the way to Mecca, and all her friends go back with a child except her. That looks very shameful and embarrassing for her. So she was sitting down with her husband, and she was saying, you know, it looks very embarrassing for us to go back empty-handed. So her husband... <coughs> So her husband suggested to her, you know, maybe that child, that orphan child, maybe it will be a good idea if we take him, at least we look like we came back with something. No one's going to know that we got paid or not, but at least we don't go back being embarrassed or else people will start looking down at us. So she said, you know what, I'll take him. Maybe Allah will bless us from behind him. You don't know. Maybe there will come a blessing. <laughs> and no doubt what she thought came, but a lot more than what she expected. She took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she went back. She went back. When she came, she came on a female donkey. And her female donkey was always the last donkey to catch up with the rest of the caravan. When she came back, her female donkey was running in front of everyone. All her friends were saying, Oh Halima, did you buy a new donkey? Is that a new donkey? Or is it something that you've been gifted? Where did you get this donkey from? She's saying, but Allah, it is the same donkey that I came on. Everyone's saying, but no why before when you came, you always in the last line. Now you are defeating us, you're always at the front line. That's not the same donkey. She said, but Allah, it is the same donkey. SubhanAllah, the blessings and the barakah of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, and it started to come upon her and her family. When she arrived to her town, she said that we were living a time of drought. And her goats, the other of the goats were empty because there's no, there's no grass to eat. She said, but Allah, the same night that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into our house, the next morning, it's like a different world. It's like a different world, a different goat, different land. Allah Azza wa started to bless the land from being so dry into being so moist and a lot of blessings and the goat that we had. The other of it became so full that we drank and we drank and the whole family drank. The blessings, these are the blessings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they realized that they have chosen a great choice. This is not just an orphan kid, but there's something behind that child. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will live with Halima for up to six years. The Arab usually keep their children there for two years, three years, but Halima Living with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that young child, that blessed child, although she doesn't know, and she does not know, have any idea what's the future of this child, she, see, she start to practically see the blessings of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. When Amina, the mother of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, wanted to take him back, Halima insisted that the Prophet sallallahu stays with her. Until an amazing event took place, which is the opening of the chest of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And let the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrate this to us. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, When I was in the lands of Halim al Sadiya, two angels came to me. Two angels came to me. One of them was Jibreel. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, I was playing with the kids, like every other children, playing outside in the park or in the desert or whatever they had then. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said, two men came to me. There were two angels. One of them is Jibreel, came in a form of men. One of them said, is that him? The other one said, that's him. So they grabbed him and took him. Now the other children saw two big men. They're not going to fight him. Maybe if they were Aussies, maybe they end up punching on with them. You know, the Australian kids. But they, you know, the, two, the, two, the children that were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they, they ran away, the two big men. So they ran to their mother, Halima Saadiya. And those two men took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa behind a small hill where no one can see. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he says, I was forced to be put on the ground and then they opened my chest, took my heart, and out of my heart 
they took a clot out. They took a little piece of meat or a clot and they said, This is the luck or the portion of the shaitan from you. They took it out, washed the heart of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a golden plate with zamzam water, put it back where it belongs and put back the chest of the Prophet وسلم, the way it was and then the Prophet وسلم, was left to go. The Prophet والسلام, went back to his mother or his breastfeeding mother Halima Saadiya and yani the Arab used to refer to the breastfeeding mother as a mother. He went back to his breastfeeding mother, Halima Saadiya. She says, but Allah I saw his face, different colors. After I heard what he told me, she got so scared, she, so she took him back to his mother. She, this is an amazing story. And she knows, six years, she's experienced the Prophet Sallallahu He doesn't lie. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, two men, poor men, I opened my heart and I saw this, that, she obviously, maybe she, he's a child, but at the same time, she knows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't lie. So there's something funny here. So she took him back to his mother. Go back to your mother. Allah, I don't want any problems here. Later on, something happens. Your parents come back to me. Go back to your mother. Now, going back to this incident, which is authentic narration of the, uh, being narrated by Imam Muslim and many other scholars, how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's heart was taken out and a clot, يعني, a piece of meat was taken out and that was the hadith shaitan. The scholars say everyone is born with that. Every single person is born, of course, with a heart and there is a portion in that heart, a clot, okay? Whether you take it literally or metaphorically, okay? There is a clot that each person has a clot which is the portion of the shaitan. Now that depends on you how you deal with that clot. Do you open it up to the shaitan to take advantage of you? Or do you close it and keep it away from the shaitan? This is how Allah Azza wa created us. Allah created all of us with desires. Every single human being is created with a desire. We can't run away from our desires because Allah created it in us. But it depends how we deal with that desires. Some people master their desires. Others, their desires master them. Some people lead their desires and others their desires lead them. Some people make their desires above them and others make their desires under them. And that goes back to your iman. With your faith and your iman and your taqwa and your belief and your fear of Allah Azza wa Jal and love to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and your close relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, you have the ability to control your desire. But when you are far away from Allah Azza wa Jal, you are disattached from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, you are neglecting Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala's commandments, then your desires control you. So this is where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu states very clearly that there is a portion in the heart, but that portion was taken away from the Prophet And his heart was cleaned in a golden plate or plot, uh, in a golden plate or pot, and uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu heart was put back into where it belongs. At that time, when Halima saw the face of the Prophet والسلام, and how his face changed and she heard the story from him, she sent him back to his mother. Now the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from living with Harima Saadiya and her children, and this is also a point for you to keep in mind, that the Prophet وسلم, has now brothers and sisters from breastfeeding. And inshallah we'll hear later on throughout the biography of the Prophet وسلم, how the Prophet وسلم, had brothers and sisters from breastfeeding. Now the Prophet وسلم, lives with his mother, Amina. Only, it was early moments and only months away where Amina, the mother of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, passes away. Where Amina, the mother of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam, will go one day to visit the grave of her husband Abdullah as a loyalty to him and love to him. And Abdullah was buried just a few kilometers away from Medina. When Amina went there on the way back, she became ill and sick and she passed away. Now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa being born with no father by the age of six, no mother, now to be passed on to his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, as we said, he used to be a noble, respectful man. Yes, Abdullah, the father of the Prophet sallallahu Amina, the mother of the Prophet sallallahu Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather, the all died non-Muslims. There is a disagreement on Abdullah and Amina, but the, the majority. <coughs> 
and the vast majority of scholars that the parents of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu passed away as non-Muslims. And the hadith is very clear. When a man came to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and told him a messenger of Allah about his father and he was crying about his father, so the Prophet Sallallahu told him, Abi wa abuka fin nar, my father and your father are in the hellfire. But there is a small number of scholars, including Imam al Suyuti, who wrote even a chapter about this, that they say that the parents of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam died as Ahlil, uh, Ahlil Fatra which our people did not hear the message of Islam and so forth. But again, I do say the vast majority say that the parents of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu passed away as non-Muslims. Now, Abd al-Muttalab used to be so respectful, so noble. He had leadership and he had children. He had 10 children. One of them passed away and that's Abdullah. And he had a few other children who passed away even uh, before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu so he had, you know, a few children around him. He had his cousins around him. And he used to be the leader, Sayyid, Sayyid Makkah. He used to be the leader of Mecca. Now it narrates that how Abdullah used to be so attached to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdul Muttalib, Afwan. Abdul Muttalib used to be so attached to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That Abdul Muttalib as the leader of Mecca, he used to have a, 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 he used to have a place where he used to sit as the leader of Mecca next to the Kaaba. And he used to have a mattress. That mattress is only for the leader of Mecca and Abd al-Muttalib used to sit on it. And his children used to sit around him and his cousins and the other leaders and the other respectful people used to sit around him. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was young and it's been narrated that at that age the Prophet Sallallahu became chubby, old, you know, you know, playful child as the you know, normal children grow up at that age. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to be taken by Abdul Muttalib and maybe by his uncles. And when they used to bring him to that gathering, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to sit and play on the mattress where his grandfather Abdul Muttalib sits on. And the others, his uncles used to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting on that, they used to move him. This is for the leader. Look, you know, this is a place for the leader. He can't, children or anyone to sit on it. And every time they used to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being moved by his uncles, Abdul Muttalib would say, leave my grandson alone. By Allah, I could see I could see a great future for my son. Leave him alone. Leave my grandson alone. I could see a great future for this kid. And they used to leave him. They used to leave the Prophet ﷺ and he used to be around his grandfather. Moments after that, by the age of eight, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, the Prophet ﷺ's grandfather, who is Abdul Muttalib, and the closest to him after his father passed away, for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu guardianship to be passed on to his uncle Abu Talib. So Abu Talib is the brother of the father of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abdullah and Abu Talib and Abdullah are the children of Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib is one of the elderly children of Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib as we know and we will hear who stood by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and lived throughout the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam's life all the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was nearly 45 years old he was there, he loved the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam the way he loved his own children he took care of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam the way he took care of his own children he, he, he tried to compensate the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam the emotions of the father that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam missed out on for that and no doubt Abu Talib passed away as a non-Muslim but because of his sympathy to the Prophet ﷺ, because of his stance to the Prophet ﷺ, Allah reduced from the painful punishment of Abu Talib in the hellfire than what it should be. And inshallah we'll hear about that and we'll leave that inshallah when we hear the next phase of the Prophet ﷺ living with his uncle Abu Talib and he's traveling towards Damascus and the amazing miracles that we we'll hear even before the prophecy and how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa became a Jew and he grew up and got married to prepare him for the prophecy and the great message of Islam that we're all here for. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you and accept from all of us and use us for this deen. Subhanak Allah, bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastafru To listen to or download more Islamic lectures, please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au.